Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Facebook, Twitter, uh, even online Bible uh, study sites all keep track of what are the most shared verses on social media. And on all the lists that I've seen, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 is in the top five of the most shared verses on social media that we all bounce to and link to and share with each other. Which brings us to this, uh, th this reality. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is a verse that you've heard before. Your Aunt Ruth cross-stitched it for you. You wrote it in a card to your friend when they got engaged. And we've all kind of traded in the currency of this verse with each other before. Which brings us to the reality that, particularly with this verse... The biggest barrier to your knowledge of the Bible is your current knowledge of the Bible. You have an idea. Maybe it's not even an idea. You have an emotional reflection about what this verse means. So you think you've got it, but you don't. Just because you're familiar with something doesn't mean you have any idea what's really in it. You can pass by something, you can handle something every day and not really understand it. The longer I'm at this, the more convinced I become that so much of what we think is our knowledge of the Bible is actually our sentimental feelings around and about the Bible. But is this really what the Bible actually says and what it promises. What does it mean to trust in the Lord with all of our heart? And what is God promising when he promises? Verse six, the second half, that he'll make our pathway straight. Trusting God doesn't mean maybe what we think it means and what is the promise that he gives us. The pattern in Proverbs 3 is there's a command in the odd verses and there's a promise in the even verses. There's a command, God says, you have to do this, and then God obligates himself in the even verses and he says, if you do this, then I myself, God, promise to do this for you. So what's the promise that God makes to us that he'll make our path straight? What does, what does this mean? What do we have to do to get the good benefit of God making our pathway straight for us? What does it mean to trust in the Lord? Trusting in God certainly doesn't mean emptying your mind and taking a mystical leap into the dark. Trusting in God Living a life of wisdom, according to the book of Proverbs, means this. Human attention to divine revelation. In the book of Proverbs, trusting God. In the book of Proverbs, living a life of wisdom simply means this. Human attention to divine revelation. Trusting in God does not mean... Uh, emptying yourself of all thought and achieving some mystical state. It means human attention to divine revelation. Here, it means not trusting in your own understanding. Trusting in God, according to this verse, means a persistent refusal to follow your own wisdom and a persistent insistence on knowing God's wisdom. A persistent refusal to follow your own wisdom and a persistent insistence on knowing God's wisdom. Can we push past our emotional responses to the Bible and drill down to what the Bible's actually saying here. What does it mean, trust in the Lord with all your heart? The easiest way 
to have what you think is the Bible actually be just your emotional responses to the Bible, the easiest way to achieve that state is to pull individual verses up out of the scripture, just read them once, and then think and imagine and dream about whatever you feel like thinking and imagining and dreaming about. The easiest way to actually get what the Bible is teaching is to place every verse right here in its context and see what God says about what he's saying. So here in the context, what does it mean to trust in the Lord with all your heart? In the near context, Proverbs 3, verse 1, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Right here in Proverbs 3, verse 1, to trust God means human attention to divine revelation. It means consistent interaction with divine revelation, refusing to forget it and always remembering it. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 6. The immediate context of our verse, Proverbs 3, 5, is Proverbs 3, 2, and 1. Look at 2, uh, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words, treasure up my commandments within you. Make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight, raise your voice for understanding. Seek it like silver. Search for it as for hidden treasures. Then you'll understand the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 6, is filled with action verbs. And if we were to draw them, every one of these verbs is an arrow from your heart out. Trusting in God, heeding God's word, following God's revelation, finding God's wisdom. None of these is an arrow inward. Trust your own heart. None of them is. From the very beginning of the book of Proverbs, he says in Proverbs 1 verse 2, this is the reason I'm writing, that you may know wisdom and instruction and understand words of insight and receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. So certainly trusting God isn't some mind-emptying state of mysticism and guessing and holy zaps. Certainly trusting God is human attention to divine revelation. According to the book of Proverbs, trusting God, according to the book of Proverbs, wisdom is this. Finding God's perspective, thinking through God's principles, and following God's pathways. That's what it is. Wisdom in the book of Proverbs is finding God's perspective thinking through God's principles and following God's paths. That's what wisdom is. Find God's perspective, think through God's principles and follow God's paths. My interpretive paraphrase of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, what it's actually saying, if you didn't make me translate the Hebrew, but you let me paraphrase, what the point that Solomon is getting at is this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Stop listening to yourself. Stop listening to the whispered voices of your own wishes. Stop leaning on your own understandings. Instead, trust God enough to pay attention to what he's saying right here in the book of Proverbs. Instead, trust God enough to learn and depend on what he's teaching you right now as you're reading this book. Notice the parallel of trust and lean. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. And notice the parallel, uh, trust in the Lord or lean on your own understanding. If you lean on God... If you lean on God's wisdom, if you lean on God's principles and God's paths, you'll get peace and a straight pathway. If you lean on your own thinking and your own desires, your way will end up crooked. This is saying lean on his word, not on your wishes. Lean on his word. Not on your wishes. The concept is parallel to Proverbs 28, verse 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. But he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Proverbs 28, 26. Whoever trusts his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. And what's the reward? In all your ways acknowledge him, verse 6 says, and he will make straight your paths. 
What's the reward? We have sentimental feelings about the Bible, what we think it means. Here's the pin. I'm not afraid of becoming your enemy. As a faithful Bible teacher, I want to pop the wish-filled balloon if it's just our sentiments about what this verse means. What is the promise of verse 6 when God himself says he will make your path straight? What is he promising? Because I guarantee you this. If your wishes about what he's promising are, are, are fueling your path and it doesn't come to pass, you'll resent God for not coming through and God will say, well, I never promised what you thought I promised. Those were just your wishes. But I guarantee you this, if you understand what verse six really promises, God himself is providing a rock solid promise for us that we can bank on. He says, I will make your path straight. What does this mean? Well, in Proverbs uh, Look at where this phrase shows up in, in, the, in the immediate context. In Proverbs 2, verse 13, it says that the, the wicked people, Proverbs 2, 13, forsake the path of uprightness and walk in ways of darkness. They rejoice in doing evil. They delight in the perverseness of evil. Verse 15 of chapter 2, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. The opposite of a straight path is a crooked, devious, wicked path. Look at chapter 3, verse 17. This is wisdom speaking, and in 3.17, it says that all of her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all of her paths are paths of peace. The straight path is the path of wisdom, the path of peace. And Proverbs 10, verse 9 says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. The crooked path is the wicked path. The straight path is the righteous path. So again, not in a, not in a flat-out attempt to become your enemy, but in a flat-out attempt to teach the Bible accurately and pop a balloon that's a balloon of your own making and not a divine promise. Proverbs 3, verse 6 is not a promise that if you do this, God will give you individualized guidance and he will show you by the Toyota, not the Honda. It's not, a, it's not a guarantee of individualized guidance. It's a promise that if you trust in the Lord and pay attention to divine revelation, your way will not end up shattered in the crookedness of perversity, but your way will end up in the shalom and righteousness of God's wisdom. It means guidance, it means guardianship, it means presence and peace, it means perseverance in the way of righteousness. So to pick on our treasured emotional kind of understanding of this text, it doesn't exactly mean if you pray, God will show you exactly who to marry, exactly what, God, uh, what job to take, exactly all those things. In preparation for this sermon, I read through the book of Proverbs, and this is my conclusion. If you don't believe me, you read through the book of Proverbs this week and you tell me if your conclusion is different than mine. But this is my conclusion having read through every verse in the book of Proverbs. What we find in the book of Proverbs is exactly... Zero verses where God promises to give you personal divine revelation. Zero. What we find in the book of Proverbs are dozens and dozens and dozens of verses that promise this. If you stop believing worldly lies, if you stop believing self-centered lies, and you start giving your human attention to divine revelation, then what will happen is your life will become beautiful. You'll be on the path of wisdom and righteousness. That's what he's saying. To trust God is to follow his instructions, not my impressions. So let's drill down and figure out what it means to trust God. Trust 
Trust God, trusting God. We talk a lot about trust. It's a, it's a church word. We're supposed to trust God. What do we mean by the word trust? You used the word trust last week, didn't you? You opened up the fridge. Oh, I'm not sure I trust this potato salad. It's been in there since family reunion. That was like in June. You know, I'm not sure we should eat this. You're on your computer, you're buying tickets or a news hoodie or something. You're like, you know, I'm going to put my credit card in here. Can I trust the security of this site to take care of my, my business? Trust. What does it mean in verse 5 when it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart? Don't miss two things about it. It's personal and it's pervasive. First, it's personal. Trust in the Lord. It's personal. Trust in the Lord. It's personal. It's the Lord. It's Him. Listen, trust in the Lord. Can I just say it this way? It's personal in the sense that it doesn't say that at, at, the, at the bedrock, we trust in a book. It doesn't say that at the bedrock, we trust in a religion. It doesn't say that at the bedrock, we trust in a teaching or in a system. It says we trust in the Lord, a living feeling, existing person, me, trusts in the living God who exists and who is and who is good and who is a rewarder of those who seek him. It's a personal relationship. It's personal. Why does this matter? It matters because if it wasn't personal, it could be merely mechanical. You could say, when I was 14, I went to a Christian thing and I checked the box that I would be a Christian. And that's that. Some of you are actually trying to bank on that. And it's killing you. If you continue to bank on that, you'll end up in hell. This is personal. Personal. And second, it's pervasive. You see what verse 5 says? Trust in the Lord, that's personal, with all your heart. That's pervasive, with all your heart, with all your heart. It's not 60-40, it's not 70-30, it's not 80-20, it's not 90-10, it's not 99-1. It's 100, all your heart. Why does that matter? Because if it wasn't pervasive, then this would be the case. You could live like the devil, Thursday night, Friday night, all day Saturday, show up at church on Sunday, and you'd be good to go. But this cannot be because it's pervasive, all your ways, all your heart. Some of you are currently trying to live like that. You ignore God, ignore God on the weekend, and then show up at church on Sunday. How's that going? How does your conscience feel? How secure are you? It'll eat you up from the inside out. Hypocrisy is horrifying. It's personal. It's pervasive. What does it mean to trust? What does it mean to trust? Let's be specific. To trust God means to place yourself under the care of someone who is more capable than you are. To trust God is to place yourself under the care of someone who is more capable than you are. To trust God is to say, I need to be protected. And so I'm placing myself under someone who is more powerful to protect me than I am. I need to be guided. So I'm placing myself under the guidance of someone who has better vision than I do. It's to place yourself under the care of someone who is more capable than you are. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. What does don't lean on your own understanding mean? It doesn't mean that common sense and thinking things through are things that Christians don't do. They're not useless. We should use common sense and we should think things through. But what it means is the ultimate bedrock, primary source of our confidence is not human logic and thinking things through. It's divine revelation. We should trust God. What it means to trust God and, uh, 
The parallel passage is Isaiah 55. And you don't have to turn there because when I read it, you'll recognize it. Isaiah 55 is actually another one of those places where your knowledge of the Bible is a barrier to you really knowing the Bible. You recognize Isaiah 55? Listen to this. God says, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. This is Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. We quote this to each other. We put it on a poster with the mountains, and we, and we think we're going to be inspired by it. You know what Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 is saying? I don't know where to stand to get away from the lightning. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 is frustrating. Half of my heart hates those verses because I know what ways I want to go. And I know my thoughts make a lot of sense to me. And God hasn't figured that out yet. And it bugs me every day of my life. That's what Isaiah 55 is saying. God's saying, it's my ways, not yours. It's my thoughts, not yours. And I'm down here going, God, would you please call me up for advice? God, trust me, God. I could improve your thoughts if you just checked in with me and did things my way. This is not what Isaiah 55 is saying. This is not what Proverbs 3 is saying. It is not saying, trust God and all your dreams will come true. There are ways in my life that are not going the way I want. And I have explained to God that he needs to get on my program and I'm still waiting for God to get back to me. It ain't gonna happen because he is God and I'm not. This means that we don't get it, we don't get to decide it, we don't get to control it. What we get to do is trust and obey. And I, for one, would rather control than trust and obey. So God, break my arm. God, fog and confuse my mind until I quit trying to do it on my own. How can you tell if your trust is total? Three questions, put three verses there. Again, you don't need to look them up. You probably know what they say. Romans 12, 1, Proverbs 26, and Philippians 3. How do I tell if my trust is total? First question, does the Bible change my thinking? First question, does the Bible change my thinking? Romans 12, 1 says, your thinking is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Does the Bible change my thinking? Do your most personal thoughts and most desired opinions, do your most personal thoughts and desired opinions get changed by God or not? I mean, let's face it. Some of you, if I disagree with you, you get mad at me. Or if you disagree with each other, you get mad at each other. Well, who are you to question my opinions? Well, what about God? Does he have that right or not? Second question, am I still wise in my own eyes? That's the second question. Am I still wise in my own eyes? The first question was, does the Bible rule my thinking from Romans 12, 1? Second question is, am I still wise in my own eyes? Because Proverbs 26, verse 12 says, do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs 26, 12 here is a a greater than sign. And on this side of the greater, the greater is the fool. And on the lesser side is you. If God says a fool is better off than you, you're a loser, my friend. What it says is, if you see someone who is wise in their own eyes, a fool has a better shot at life than they do. Are you still wise in your own eyes or not? 
Third question, how do I tell if my trust is total? Am I willing to obey God when it costs a lot? Am I willing to obey God when it costs a lot? Philippians 3, Paul says, I'm willing to suffer the loss of everything that I may know Christ. When's the last time you took a big risk because it was the right thing to do? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Listen, if the command had been, um, when things are difficult in your life, trust in the Lord, this would be an easy verse. Can I just tell you a pastor's uh, secret? The single easiest time for me to get into your life spiritually is when the cancer comes back. That's nothing. The easiest time for me to get into your life spiritually is when the prodigal won't come home. When things are difficult, you seek me out. Pray with me, help me, teach me. It's when things are not difficult that it's actually harder to trust in the Lord. So what if Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and the all your ways doesn't mean in the hard things? What if the thing that it really means from the Spirit of God is in the easy things, trust in the Lord? When you think you've got this, insist on telling God, I don't got nothing without you. Lead me, lead me, teach me, humble me, direct me. We need God in all of our ways. The universality of the command is demanding all of our ways, but flip it around. The same universality of the command that is demanding is also a universality that's comforting because you can do it this way. You say, what about this in my life? Can I take that to God? What about this small petty thing in my life? What about this thing in my life that I'm so ashamed of that I've never told anyone about it? Can I take that to God? The answer is yes, 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 yes. Everything, all your ways, take it to God. In the lightest, easiest things, take them to God. In the heaviest, darkest things, take them to God. And certainly we do need to trust God in all of our dark ways. It was Corey Ten Boom who said that when the train goes through a tunnel and everything gets dark, that is not the moment when you throw away your ticket and jump out the window. It's when you sit in your seat and trust the engineer. In all your ways, trust God. So how do I trust God? Three words, no talk, give. And this is what they mean. First, how do I trust God? No. By that I mean this. No, God. The more I know of his character, the more I can trust him in every circumstance. The more I know of his character, the more I can trust him in every circumstance. How do I trust God? I have to know him. The more, I've, I, the more I know of his character, the more I can trust him in every circumstance. It says trust in the Lord, in the Lord. So it all comes back to who is the Lord and how trustworthy is he. The more I know of his character, the better off I am. This is why, hello? Hello? This is why you should read your Bible every day. Hello? This is why you should sign up for a Firm Foundations course on Wednesday nights. This is why. It's not so that you can earn an attendance sticker. It's not so that you can check off, yeah, I read through the whole Old Testament. I didn't peter out in Leviticus. That's not why you read the Bible every day. Right, what is the purpose? Write with a Sharpie somewhere you can see where you see it every morning when you read your Bible. I am reading my Bible today so that I can know more of God's character and trust him in more of my circumstances. That's why you're reading the Bible. We trust, we trust not because a God exists. We trust because this God is our God. 
by his oath, his covenant, his blood. He has made us his. This is our God. That's why we trust, because of who he is and the covenant he has made, sealing it by rending his own body in two. Know God. I want you to know God like a local, not like a tourist. Tourist was out for a walk in the winter trying to cross a a river on a hike and it was frozen, but this tourist just wasn't sure how thick the ice was, so he's just kind of creaking his way across. And he hears some commotion behind him. Here come five locals on snowmobiles and three people behind them walking their big fat bulldogs and they just all bound across the river. This is the knowledge that the locals have. I don't want you to only know God from what I say here on Sunday for 40 minutes at a crack. I want you to have the knowledge of the local. This is your God. Well, get into his word. Get into a firm foundation. Get into it, and you'll know God. The second answer to how, how do I trust? Talk. This is easy. What I mean by talk is this. Talk to God about everything all the time. Talk to God about everything all the time. Pray without ceasing. Pray throughout the day. Talk to God about everything all the time. Some of you, your life is so busy, you don't talk to God enough. Some of you, your life is so lonely and boring that you don't talk to God enough. You need to talk to God about everything all the time. Charles Spurgeon, his his lectures to his students, one of the best lines in there is Spurgeon simply says to his students, I have found it a most profitable practice to utter up to God a few lines of prayer in between everything I do all day long. Just pray to God about it. And some of you, 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 there's things in your life you just never talk to God about. And those things become, become tumorous, actually. And they'll destroy you. Some of you, somebody else sinned against you. That wasn't your sin. That was their sin. They sinned against you. But you just haven't talked to God about it. And so it becomes a root of bitterness, which is your sin. Because you freeze this part of your heart and your relationship and your emotion away from God and you just won't talk to him about it. And it'll drag you under Talk to God about everything, all the time. This is what it means to cast all our anxieties to him and know that he cares for us. When I say pray about everything all day long, I, I I mean make very unimpressive, simple prayers your habit all day long. Don't impress God. Don't fill it with flowery language. Just say, God, this person's annoying me. And I don't want to be the jerk that I would be because Jesus isn't a jerk to me. Help me to be like Jesus right now. Simple, simple prayers. Talk to God about everything all the time. And the third answer to how do we trust, give. By that I mean this, give everything to God all your heart, all your life. Give everything to God. All your heart, all your life. Give your whole heart to God. Verse five says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Another verse that's parallel, you don't have to turn there, Psalm 86. You don't have to turn there, you just need two words out of Psalm 86. The adjective and the noun, and here they are, undivided heart undivided heart. Psalm 86 says, Lord, you alone are great and you do wonders. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I might walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, with all my heart. An undivided heart. An undivided heart. What a great prayer to pray. God, give me an undivided heart. We all have a tendency toward divided hearts. Lord, give me an undivided heart. What is the purpose that you read the Bible every morning? Why? Why? Why do you do it? 
right there, somewhere you could see, the reason I'm reading the Bible today is so that my heart can become undivided for God. That's the reason why. Make your prayer time a time when you give everything to God, when you ask the Spirit of God to obliterate all the divisions in your heart that you'll be all in with all your heart. God says, I want you to love me with all your heart. God complains of divided allegiance as much as of no allegiance. He, he won't settle for 80-20. In God's arithmetic, that's zero. All your heart, all your heart. The word of C.S. Lewis, I think I shared this quote with you before, it's one of his best. He says, it is not so much of our time or so much of our attention that God demands. It's not even all of our time or all of God or all of our attention that God demands. It is ourselves. What cannot be admitted, what cannot be admitted in dealing with God is the idea that there will be something of our own left over. This will never be, for God claims all. God is love and he will bless us. And God will not bless us unless he has us. And when we try to keep within ourselves an area of our own, we are keeping within ourselves an area of death. Therefore, in love, God claims all. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. We come to this table because none of us has trusted in the Lord and obeyed the Lord with all of our ways and all of our heart. And this table is the remembrance that there is one who gave all of his body and blood for us because we had not given all of our heart to God. Remember him and let this be an act of worship.